Hey, Alan. Hi, how are you? Pretty good, yourself? Yeah, good, good. I see you have a, uh, is that a presentation you have set up there? I do, I do. I've got a couple slides just to get the conversation started and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, cool, cool. So um, I guess we've got a few seconds before we start. Um, there haven't been so many questions come in, uh, to be honest, on the event. Uh, I'll, I'll ask people to ask questions, but uh, um, yeah, we, we can sort of take it from there. Is it uh, just yourself or is anyone else joining? It is only myself right now, um, and there's a few other people that I'm hoping will hop in, um, but I'm not 100% sure at this point. So, Okay, hoping, no problem. Hoping we'll get uh, some audience participation and some questions that we can go through. That is, right. that is okay. Sounds good. So, um, well, it, it's on the hour, so so we'll get started. Um, this is um, Matt from Pike, if I'm pronouncing correctly. Pike, are we okay with that? Yeah, yeah. works. Okay, great. So he's going to give some thoughts on uh, API management automation. It would be very nice if you in the audience could give us a few uh, questions as we go along. Um, other than that, the, the stage is yours, Matt. Awesome. Thank you very much, Alan. So yeah, as Alan mentioned, we're going to be talking on some thoughts on API management and automation and kind of where that all fits into the puzzle. So I'll give a quick intro to who I am. So I'm Matt. I'm a product evangelist at Tyke. And uh, yeah, very happy to be here at API Days Helsinki to I'll be doing this. And then I'll also be doing a follow up talk as well um, tomorrow. And uh, we'll be covering some of the Tyke aspects of uh, API management and automation. So the first thing that I want to be very straightforward on is what do I mean by automation? Or what should we be thinking about when it comes to automation and API management? What I'm talking about specifically is infrastructure as code, CI, CD stuff, and managing code and infrastructure as it moves from lower to higher environments. So we're not talking about unit testing. We're not talking about regression testing. We're talking about mainly infrastructure as code and configuring API management in that perspective. So it's important for us to keep in mind the fact that our re there are really two different approaches to how we can look at automation, especially with API management. So we can look at imperative versus declarative. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, imperative is basically a set of instructions that's gonna get you from where you are to where you wanna go. So if you think of that in the real world, it would kind of be like, um, you know, you hop in your car, Google Maps tells you you need to take this step, this step, this step, this step, and then you arrive at your destination, but you still have to make sure that you execute those steps correctly. If they're executed out of order, then you might not get to where you need to go. That is kind of the, the crux of imperative. However, uh, a lot of systems support imperative automation. And now for those of you who are doing, uh, let's say something along the lines of Kubernetes, you may be more familiar with declarative automation. So this means that you basically say where you want to go and you arrive there. So it's more of a black box approach. This is, this is kind of my blueprint and here's what I expect the outcome to be. Going along with our overview of what we just said about imperative, this would be similar to taking an Uber. So you'd be more inclined to just hop in, say, this is where I need to go. And however that actually gets there is really not of significance. What you care about is that you end at your destination. Now within Tyke, we do support uh, a couple of different ways of supporting both of those paradigms. Now with imperative automation within Tyke, so being able to kind of put that step-by-step -step build, what you end up with is you can use our Tyke gateway APIs. So for this, you could build, you know, build a script that allows you to configure the core of the API management system. And then we also have the dashboard APIs for those who are using the enterprise version. Uh, it gives you a little bit more extended functionality and gives you a little more configuration options. So with this, you would be able to basically, you know, step-by-step -step set up your API management configuration uh, and automate all of that. So as you're, you know, maybe you would define all this stuff within your development environment, make sure it's working there. But then when you start to move through those higher environments all the way up to prod, 
it would then mean that, you know, you've already tested this stuff and it's there to be used. And that's for the imperative portion of things. Now, one thing we've become very, uh, very crazy about in the last little bit uh, at Tyke is declarative automation within Tyke. So for that, we've actually created a Kubernetes operator, which we've called the Tyke operator, which allows you to do declarative API management right within Tyke. So for this, we're able to basically create a blueprint and Tyke is able to, well, Kubernetes and Tyke are able to work together with the operator to make sure that the configuration that you need is exactly what you end up with. So it's the thing that I, I like the best about this is the fact that if there is some type of hiccup, um, if you're doing an imperative approach, you would have to then factor that in. So uh, let's say the system is configured just slightly differently. Things don't go according to plan. Your actual build may break and you would then have to remedy that somehow. Um, so there's a little more debugging with it. Whereas when you use something like Tyke Operator and declarative automation, what you get is the system actually figures out how to remedy that. Or if something isn't quite set up correctly, there's a higher chance that it will be able to remedy it without any intervention from, from the actual uh, user's perspective. All right, let's move to this here. So what are we actually here to talk about? Well, we're looking for some thoughts on the following, and I'm hoping that our audience will chime in uh, with some questions, maybe some comments, because really what I'm, I'm here to do is facilitate uh, some ideas so that everyone can walk away with some, some new approaches if they're not currently using uh, API management or maybe they're not using uh, automated API management. So I've kind of put together five questions here that we can use as conversation starters. And the first one is, are you currently automating any of your API management functionality? So this, this could, if we think about how we would look at this within a type realm, we know we need to create the infrastructure install Tyke or our API management platform on that, and then configure that to make sure that our, all, all of our APIs that are using that API management platform are wired up and, and wired in. Then we could talk about, you know, what kind of tools and platforms are you using for automation? Uh, there are tons out there. And actually, as I've been diving into this more and more, I've realized that uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'd never heard of before that are quite popular. So there's a, a plethora of, of tools out there it would be great to hear what ones you're using. And uh, then we move on to the next one, which would be what issues have you come across while introducing or improving your automation? So that may be from a, a tooling perspective. It also may be from a maybe organizational, organizational or business perspective. Uh, there's always those challenges, uh, many different facets when it comes to uh, you know, improving your automation or, or doing it for the first time. Then, we can look at what benefits your tech team has noticed because of the automation efforts. And uh, I think most of us, even if we don't look at it from an API management perspective, if you look at the improvements we've made in the last couple of years uh, within, our, within our industry, at how much easier it is to deploy infrastructure, configure infrastructure with all of these new tools, um, yeah, it would be great to hear some of the benefits that, that your team has experienced. And lastly, we've got any other tips or tricks uh, uh, for those just moving into automation? So there are going to be people who are currently heavily into automation, and there's going to be some that are very heavily into automation. And it's it's cool to kind of make sure that we've passed along some of those lessons. And uh, it's one of those things where you don't really know it until you experienced it. So it's always great to not make the same mistake twice. So if you have anything that you can share, uh, maybe maybe any. Even if, it's, even if it's not API management related, um, I'm sure many people would be happy to hear that. So with that being said, um, I can say, so we'll start off with the first one and I'll go off my previous experience, which is, are, so are we currently using any type of, of API and functionality? Previously at, at organizations that I've worked at, I would say no. We, what we did was we did configure all of our API management manually. Uh, we did have you know blueprints and this type of stuff that allows us to get the base configuration, but it still meant that we had a team of folks setting up things uh, basically in a very manual manner throughout the environments. 
And uh, yeah, it, it meant that there was a lot more time taken up than needed to be. And then looking at some of the newer stuff that Tykes put out and that we've been working on, you can see that there would be a massive amount of, of uh, efficiency gained by taking that approach. Let me just see who we've got within the people tab here. Well, we've got a few people here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's a few people in um, that are probably a bit shy. But um, yeah, I'm sure we'll get like at least one question by the, by the end of this. So, I, I mean, Matt, I would I would like to you know go back a step. Um, sure. Yeah, maybe people who aren't so you know into automation uh, and when it comes to API M API management automation, what what part are you talking about effectively? What can you give us like a real world example of what you're talking sure. about when you talk about automation? Sure. Yeah. So let's let's think about how kind of the the project lifecycle will work when it comes to implementing the initial API management structure. So we'd have to create the infrastructure to host our platform. Then we would have to configure or deploy that API management platform onto that infrastructure. That part is relatively easy to automate. Um, if we think about it, I mean, there's tons of tools that would allow us to do that. The, the hardest part though is replicating the actual configuration of, of integrating those APIs in. So when we start looking at, especially with more complex API management uh, solutions, there may be more configuration there than just saying, here's my upstream API, here's what I want the gateway URL to be, and then linking the two up. Um, with Tyke, we have stuff where uh, we have plugins that can be enabled. We have uh, different features that allow you to, you know, build GraphQL endpoints with RESTful APIs. All of these things, there's there's a chance that when you set them up manually, that you will do something incorrectly. Or if you export, you know, if you export um, the configuration, maybe when you apply it to your new instance, it may not work correctly. I do have some Slack messages coming in from folks at Tyke, so let me just check that. Um, to see if there's some, I know there's a few people on here. I just want to make sure that I've covered okay. all my bases. Let's see. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so that that would be kind of, it's kind of full life cycle, right? So infrastructure, deploying the platform, and then actually making sure, like the, the end goal is to be able to basically click a button, and by the end of it, you have the entire APIM structure set up, and you should be able to hit, whether it's a simple endpoint, uh, you know, that's just proxying to an upstream service, or any of those more complex ones that are using plugins, you should be able to, let's just say from a Tyke operator perspective, plug in this blueprint, and within 10 minutes or whatever, the infrastructure's up, the platform's up, the APIs are, are easily usable. And obviously within a Kubernetes type environment where you have, you know, multiple instances that are coming up and down, it's very important to make sure that when you are scaling or an instance goes down and another one's brought up, that it's it's exactly similar and that you're not gonna have issues uh, if you do hit a some type of, of configuration issue. Does that, right. does that make it a little bit better? Uh, I, I, it's such a large yeah, topic. Yeah, it's, exactly, it, it's a large topic, but it was just for, you know, those guys that are kind of like a little bit new to, to the concept of like, what, what, what exactly you're talking about. I mean, I, I can say also from my personal experience at working at uh, Lithic Swisscom, it's a while ago now, but you know, large telecommunications provider in Switzerland, and we had an API management uh, system in place, um, but we didn't have any automation at all. Uh, everything was just, you know, manually pushed, you know, and there are a lot of errors and so on. So, so we got a team together and they created a pipeline, but it was a team of four developers and they worked for many, you know, weeks or months uh, in order to get it. Uh, is the value proposition here from Tyke that they're getting this stuff more or less out of the box or what's, what's the configuration effort? Yeah. So it, it is now our, I'll, I'll go from, the imperative and the declarative side. So it is available out of the box and our gateway APIs and our Tyke operator are actually all open source. So they are available, you know, publicly available, no, no tiered pricing needed um, for those features. The only thing is from a dashboard API, which if you, if you do dig into Tyke a little bit, you'll, you'll be able to understand the difference. Um, that's kind of the enterprise offering. It's anything you can do within the gateway APIs, 
uh, you know, most of it, except for those enterprise features, you'll be able to configure. The dashboard APIs just give you a little bit more, um, a little bit more availability to configure it a bit further. So it is available out of the box, open source. The, the Tyke operator is relatively new, uh, but it is something that we're actively building, actively working on, and that functionality has, uh, in the last few months, has really, really um, blossomed out. But available out of the box, uh, we have some very good documentation that shows you how to walk through all of that, and we're going to have more and more and more uh, as we we dig into it. But uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things where if, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, uh, it, it's very easy to get started with. The biggest hurdle to me, uh, being someone who's not overly familiar with Kubernetes, is if I take that approach of using the Tyke operator and going the Kubernetes route, there are some complexities to getting started. So I think the biggest hurdle when it comes to that automation is actually getting used to the platform you're gonna be using for automation, which would be Kubernetes, or you might use something like Ansible, um, which we're, we're yeah. also working on. We're working on uh, install using Ansible, which uh, Zaid, which is one of our uh, uh, consulting engineers is putting together. Uh, but yeah, all of this stuff is, is readily available. As long as you know the platforms, it'll be easy. But if you don't know the platforms, it's still much easier and probably over the long term more consistent than doing things manually that like you and I are, are used to seeing at our previous companies. Right, right. And, and if we come into, you know, one of your, your examples then, because I think the declarative is is the more interesting of the two examples. Is it so that, you know, you've effectively done a lot of the work in the background um, so that you can just come along and say, okay, what you want, and then it's basically, uh, it's going to work it out for you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, let's think about what might happen if it's, it's easiest if you compare the two approaches. So if you, if you think of an imperative approach, let's think when we run a script, okay? We run a script, uh, the script for some reason, let's just say we have some weird edge case that we've hit on this specific machine, the script stops. Well, mm -hmm. what do we do next? Either we can get rid of everything and rerun the script, or we can alter that script to say, you know, if this stuff is already done, don't do this again and continue from where you're at. So mm -hmm. what really happens when you take that imperative or, you know, step-by-step -step approach is the, the machine or the platform has to be in a very specific state. Uh, if you say install Linux or install Tyke and Tyke is already installed, what then happens? Uh, does mm -hmm. the system break? We don't really know. It depends. Maybe we're running on, you know, RHEL 7 and we're running on Debian. Uh, and, and those two systems are going to handle it differently. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But let's just say that's a factor. Then we have to kind of really manipulate that script to make sure that we've covered all of those issues. Whereas when you take an approach with, with declarative, what happens is, is that it doesn't really matter what state the 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 machine or the platform is in at that point because the the engine or you know the, the kubernetes engine itself that's going to be building up this this uh infrastructure and configuring it doesn't really care where it's at because it already has those contingencies built in place so it's more of a black box approach here's what i want and at the end of it you know that pending everything has run successfully which is a much higher chance with a declarative approach um then you're going to come out with exactly what you're looking for. Whereas if you take the imperative approach using, let's say, step-by-step -step API configuration, you, I feel like you need to still do a pretty, uh, pretty good health check to make sure that, okay, did everything actually get set up as I asked? Because maybe there was an error that occurred or maybe a step was missed. Uh, and there's also, it's a little tougher to debug too, right? If it mm -hmm. fails, and you don't know where it failed, then you need to debug to see where it failed, fix that step, and move forward. Declaratively, you, you're not really going to run into that uh, because, for instance, the Tyke operator itself is going to know how to configure the Tyke platform. And Kubernetes is going to know how to configure or, or actually procure your instances that you're going to be running this on. Cool, cool. How about um, if, if we take a step in the direction of more you know, talking about developers and teams, you know, and how they, they go through the, the methodology of building APIs and deploying them. Um, in my experience, I've seen that 
especially when you're you're dealing with uh, you know an outsourced environment where where the development is done offshore somewhere maybe you you get some guys who are really good and they they do a really good job on deploying the APIs and then and then some people don't follow like processes and and then you end up with like you know bad APIs in production. Is there a way here where you can um, you know, uh, streamline that process, make sure the quality is built into the API before it's deployed. Is that sort of the direction here as well? Um, yeah, it's good. It's good to make sure that we segregate the fact that we have our upstream APIs and then we have our API management platform itself. So from an mm -hmm. API quality perspective, um, you, your upstream is always going to be that variable, right? If you especially have multiple teams working on things, making sure that things are built to spec, is still going to be within that silo. What I can see, though, from an automation perspective, is that there's well, there's kind of two facets to it. Because if you're able to automate the that scale up of of the API management platform and take away some of the hours and the days needed to configure it, that means that you can focus more efforts on the upstream builds. Uh, so that's kind of one facet to it, being able to free up those hours, because as developers, as, as tech leads, we know that infrastructure is usually what stops us from being able to deploy on time. Um, and that means that we have all hands on deck trying to get this stuff done and we're taking away from the actual development. So from a, from a more of a development team perspective, that's kind of the, one of the pros that I would see. The other one is making sure that you know your dev team can actually configure this stuff so you don't need to necessarily worry about your ops team having time within their schedule um, with a declarative approach your development team could actually utilize the type operator or whatever kubernetes operator you want to use to set up your other stuff um, okay. they could use that and therefore they're no longer relying on the ops team to have you know three days to make sure that they can procure all of that. Uh, you can do all of the networking uh, configuration that sometimes takes uh, even more time to do when you're waiting on an ops team. Uh, you can offload that to your developers. Obviously it's good to still have your ops team in the loop, yeah. but if, if the availability isn't there, this is a way for us to get much closer to allowing us to do, I mean, basically the premise around infrastructure as code, being able to allow developers to set up this stuff to their needs without having to involve, you know, a whole bunch of, of other folks. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I like that. Uh, what about taking it like the last mile then? What about getting it into the API portal? It, it, is, is that, you know, a feasible step or does that still require like an API product manager to turn around and say, okay, you know, this gets released, this doesn't, you know, or, or is it already, you know, wired up so that it will get into the API portal? Yeah, so from that perspective, the yeah, you I see what you're saying. Where where do we cut off the automation? Yeah. Make sure yeah. that we have that. I whether this is right or wrong, this is this would be my my thoughts on that. Um automation is great, it gets us most of the way, but when it comes to decisions like that, I think you're still gonna need that uh that API product owner or whoever's actually going to be looking over to that final health check to make sure, okay, everything that is available is available and those things that aren't, aren't available. Now, I mean, what you could do is you could even automate from that perspective. Maybe you use, I'll go old school and say, maybe you use SOAP UI, build a test suite to make sure that you run it and all the APIs that you think are available are hit. You get back your test report and you know that your health check is done. Um, we, there may be other tools that can allow you to do that. I just know that we've used that before uh, at previous places where when we're moving from maybe from a uh, PAT, so production acceptance testing over into a production environment, we may have a, basically an API test suite available that allows us to run and make sure that all of the APIs that are available, well, should be available are the ones that should be excluded or not. Um, but when it comes to actual management of that API portal, let's say we're using a, a development portal to expose those APIs to our developers, we may still want to have some type of, of step within our, uh, our deployment life cycle to say, okay, at this point, everything is set up. We still need that product owner to go through and make sure that it fits the specification that they think it should in terms of what's available. All right. 
That's great. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got about one more minute uh, available. Last chance to ask a question, if anyone wants to ask a question, but uh, it's kind of quiet today. Um, otherwise, you know, closing thoughts, Matt? Yeah, you know, um, my closing thoughts would be the fact that if I knew about this stuff a bit more heavily prior to coming to Tyke and working with Tyke on this stuff, um, I think it would have exponentially improved the developer and probably the ops experience as well. So definitely, if you're not using this to set up your API management platform, it, it should definitely be on the radar to take a look and see if there's a way that it can help you. And lastly, if you want to know more, uh, I will be having a talk tomorrow, which I'll be going in a little more in depth into some of the pros and cons of uh, both these approaches and, and how you can integrate it into your current stack. Perfect. Thank you so much, Matt, for taking the time to come here uh, and talk and for the audience for uh, listening. Um, it was great. Uh, looking forward to your talk.